here. It's this green one. It doesn't exist. You never really face it. But what slope does it have? Negative 1, right? It's the same slope as the blue budget constraint right here. So this blue budget constraint here has MRT equals minus 1, and so does the green one. Right? They have the same slope. But the green budget constraint now gets me to the point where that fixed line right here, this green line with slope minus 1, is exactly tangent to the old indifference curve at point B. Point B is called B because it's a big green dot because Max is still not perfect at drawing. Right? But let's say that that's the point of tangency right there. At that point B, what's the marginal rate of transformation? Minus 1. Right? Marginal rate of substitution, also minus 1 because it's a point of tangency. But here comes a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's actually an important question. Trick questions are just annoying. How much are we spending at point B? Five Reese's, two Hershey's. How much money are we spending? Seven dollars. Do you have seven dollars? You do not have seven dollars. Right? As much as you wish that this would be the end of the overall impact of a price increase and move from A to B, imagine a world where you're, you have the same income, price of Reese's changes, uh, price of Reese's is the same, price of Hershey's changes, and you somehow get to maintain the same level of utility. That'd be beautiful, right? If price increases didn't require you to consume less of something. But this move here from A to B, that's my substitution effect, right? That's the effect of a facing the new price ratio of minus one uh, instead of having the prior price ratio of minus a half. Now, that can't be the end of the story, right? That can't possibly be the end of the story because what we've got now is we are on a fake budget constraint, right? We're on a fake budget constraint here, this green thing right here, where I'm violating, if we had laws of thermodynamics in, in economics, we'd be a much more well-respected science, but what we're, where we're violating this notion that you're spending more money than you have, right? This is not an option to you. So this is why I'm saying this is a budget constraint that you never observe, you never actually act on it, but to me, the economist, this is a useful way of thinking because what have you done? Hershey's became more expensive, right? Hershey's were 50 cents before, now they're a dollar, so they're relatively more expensive. What have you done? You substituted away from Hershey towards more Reese's, right? So holding your utility constant. So the substitution effect says, in a world where your utility stays constant, right? Uh, if you face these new relative prices, what would be the mix of Reese's to Hershey's, right? Ignoring the fact that you can't afford to be on that indifference curve anymore. That's what the substitution effect does. So A to B is the substitution effect. Is it consistent with our table earlier? The answer is, of course, this is Berkeley. Uh, Hershey's became relatively more expensive, so you moved away from Hershey's, right? So the substitution effect always works in the same direction. If we would have drawn the same pretty picture for Hershey's becoming cheaper, then you would have moved away from Reese's towards Hershey's, and we'll draw that some other point. So that's the substitution effect. But what's missing here? Right? What's missing here is this upsetting fact. It's almost worse than a crossing indifference curve. Is I'm violating the budget constraint, right? Uh, you can't do that. There's no borrowing here. There's no bank. There's no credit. There's no finding money outside and spending it, right? So I somehow need to get from this fake budget constraint back to one that I can afford. So in the new world, is there a budget constraint that has the right slope, the new prices, right, uh, and the income level on this picture? Hint, it's blue. All right, it's blue. So the real new budget constraint, the one you can actually afford in this new world, is the blue one. So what the income effect is going to do, it's going to move me from my substitution point here, B, back onto this blue budget constraint. Now, what does a change in income do to a budget constraint? Does it rotate it? No. Shifts it parallel. Watch this. I'm not cheating here, all right? Green budget constraint. Right? Looks like a parallel shift back down to the budget constraint that I can actually afford. So this is like a move from B back onto the budget constraint here, where I shift in my fictitious budget constraint parallel until it covers the new actual budget constraint. So the effect of moving from green from B back to blue here is going to give me the income effect, right? The change of income from B back to this particular budget constraint here. You guys don't look happy, but that's okay. Nobody ever has in the past 12 years that I've done this. Uh, all right? So I don't want to mess up this picture anymore. So let's do this again, because it's so much fun. Let's do this a couple of times for different scenarios. So I'm going to do the substitution effect and then the income effect, and then we'll play with normal and inferior goods and see what this does to us. All right? So this was the substitution effect only A to B. Now I'm going to do uh, the whole enchilada. There's this annoying commercial out right now about the whole enchilada, the whole hog, the whole whatever. Uh, so I've got this on my mind. Here we go. Seems a different good, okay? Uh, price drop for Hershey's. Uh, should I do it? Yeah. You know what? The title here is, of course, wrong, right? What did we do? Right? I mean, hopefully that was obvious to everybody that a price of Hershey's from 0 0.5 to 1 means an increase in price, not a decrease in price, right? So there's a typo in the title here. Same thing in the next one. Price increase. All right, so let's do this again, because it's so much fun. Uh, price increase for Hershey. So let's do, let's give us ourselves lots of room and draw this budget constraint. Hershey's, Reese's, all right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an income of $1.10. Price of Reese's, obviously a dollar. Price of Hershey's, also a dollar. And now I'm going to double the price of Hershey's to $2. What does that do to my budget constraint? It rotates my budget constraint in, intersects at five now. So this is what happens to your budget constraint, right? You get this nice rotation in here because the price increased. Now let's start out somewhere fun. Uh, we started out, let's say, here. Okay, this is I1. This is my indifference curve. That means I have a point of tangency right here. So you start out with a little more than five Hershey's, right? This is point A. That's my initial optimum right here. Uh, I can't make myself better off than point A. At that point, the marginal rate of transformation is minus one. Uh, can't make myself better off than that. Now, price of Hershey's increases, budget constraint rotates in, and you will ultimately move onto a lower indifference curve that's tangent to the new budget constraint somewhere. But Max is going to torture you a little bit with the substitution effect concept. So again, the question here is, what would be the mix of Hershey's and uh, Reese's uh, holding your original level of utility constant 
uh, but using the new relative prices that you're facing after the price increase. So let's do that. So take, let's use the shoelace one more time to make that move clear. Take your imaginary shoelace, right? I'm going to shift this thing parallel until I get to a point of tangency on the original indifference curve, right? Pick the point on the indifference curve that has the same slope as the new budget constraint. So just one more time here. Bam, right there somewhere. Okay, I'm going to do this electronically up here. And this is the reason why these see-through rulers are great, because as you move stuff around, you can actually see what's going on under your ruler, right? So things are nice and parallel. Here we go. Parallel. This is the point of tangency. So at A, the marginal rate of transformation is 1, right? Minus 1. And at B, the marginal rate of transformation is if you want one more Hershey's, you're going to have to give up two Reese's. So the marginal rate of transformation here is minus 2. So what's my substitution effect? Hershey's has become more expensive. Am I consuming more or fewer Hershey's after I substitute it? Fewer, right? You always substitute away uh, from the relatively more expensive good. So the substitution effect here is going to be this move from A to B, right? So you go from roughly 5.2 to 4.5 in the way I've drawn it here. Now, what's the income effect? Well, the income effect is simply going to get us onto this new budget constraint right here from point B, right? So A to B was this imaginary substitution effect where I'm now facing the new relative prices, minus 2 instead of minus 1. But now, since I can't afford B, I have to somehow come back to my new budget constraint right here, and I shift in parallel, and I figure out the highest point of tangency on this budget constraint of one of my different curves. So I'm going to pick one, and that happens to look something like this. Um, let me pick this one here. Ah, again. One. I2 looks like the point of tangency C right here is that point right there. I will answer the question that everybody wants to ask right now. How did you figure out that C is to the left and not to the right and not down here and not up here? They're my damn preferences, all right? Uh, so I'm putting those on the board. And, the re and where this thing lands is going to tell us a lot, and I'm going to draw you every known scenario uh, possible in a second. But what happens, right? Income shifts in. Am I consuming more or fewer Hershey's? I'm consuming fewer Hershey's. Right now I'm somewhere between looks like three and four units. Back off Microsoft. Okay, so I now move from this 4.5 or 4.6 point over all the way to this final point of consumption, and that's my income effect, right? The income effect is to move from B to C. What's the overall effect? If you were a marketer and you're doing focus groups and you're watching people's purchases and you randomize price changes across individual, individuals, what do you actually observe? You observe the move from A to C. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever really, a couple of noteworthy exceptions, but not relevant here, uh, observed this move from A to B and B to C. It's a way of explaining behavior, right? But it's not actually observable unless you put students in a lab and, and, and play these games with them, all right? So A to C is the overall move. Price of Hershey's went up, budget constraint rotated in. You are now worse off because you're in I2. I2 is a lower and different curve than I1, right? And you're consuming fewer Hershey's and also fewer Reese's, right? You're worse off, clearly. What I'm telling you here, though, is something else. There's an additional piece of information that I've gained here uh, about this particular individual uh, in terms of whether this good is a normal or an inferior good to them, right? So I've taken care of the substitution, and then if I switch my red budget constraint and I just switch it in or shift it in parallel, what happens? They consume fewer Hershey's. So income goes down, and they consume fewer Hershey's. What are Hershey's to max? They're a normal good, right? So based on this decomposition here, I can tell you whether Hershey's are a normal or inferior good to max, right? So if this income effect here uh, were negative, right, uh, meaning max were uh, to Hershey's are an inferior good to max, that means as this budget constraint, this imaginary one shifts in, you're consuming more Hershey's, right? So this move from B to C would actually move in the opposite direction. I'm going to draw you that in a minute. Right? But how price responsive individuals are depends on, A, the curvature of their indifference curves, how willing they are to substitute between goods, and the magnitude and direction of the income effect, meaning are goods normal or inferior to you, and how income responsive, meaning how big is your income elasticity for these goods, right? So in the old days, you would just look at the uh, price elasticity and be done with it, but there's something really fundamental going on here. How... Uh, how sensitive you are to changes in price depends on your willingness to substitute between goods, right? That governs the, the magnitude of the substitution effect, and how income sensitive your consumption of these goods are, meaning how steep is your angle curve and which direction does it go in? Do you have a question? Uh, so the 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 it would have to be somewhere right here, right? So uh, that's drawing down tangency is a nightmare, so when I do this, I'm going to give you that in a, in, a, in a different different graph, okay? But I just want to make clear why this income and substitution effect business is not something I live an economist and I was raised, I have to know it, you have to know it, right? Uh, it's actually useful because it governs how responsive to price individuals are, and it leads us back to this notion. What governs the shape of our angle curve and what governs the shape of our indifference curves? It's you. It's your preferences and wherever they came from, right? So your preferences ultimately govern how price responsive you are to something, which also explains why firms spend billions and billions and billions of dollars trying to reshape your preferences, right? Uh, you watch advertising, whether you know it or not, uh, and the goal of that advertising is to reshape your preferences or, you know, provide you with information you didn't have before, uh, but in a way to either make you, uh, you know, move your price responsiveness in a direction that, that works well for these particular firms. And we'll talk about what types of settings there are and what that really means. But it all goes back to this fundamental insight, I think, that everything in economics and these microeconomic models is driven by your tastes, right? It's not this when you were 14 and you sat somewhere out on the ledge and you talked to your buddies and it's like the system and it's the money that's bad and it's the, ugh, you know, it ultimately all comes back down to tastes of individuals and what, how these tastes govern uh, behavior. We will talk about a totally different conversation that you had on the same park bench, right? Uh, that's got to do with big firms and market power and are firms evil or are they not? And we'll have lots of insightful things to say. But this notion of the, the, the power of preferences is something that, you know, every time I step back into this classroom, I'm, I'm in awe of, all right? So you care about that. That was briefly insightful, but I'm really panicked about the midterm. So if I have to draw this on the midterm, I'm screwed. That's at least one person in the room is thinking that right now. Uh, so I've laid out a three-step program for you. Uh, I can mess with you in a variety of ways on these questions, but you can do a price drop or a price increase. doesn't matter. The concept carries over. Uh, so let's think about this for a price drop for a second. So 
the way you do is you let the price drop. What you want to do is you want to draw the new budget constraint, right? So just like we did earlier, you draw your two axes, you draw the original budget constraint, and then you draw the new budget constraint. In this particular case, if the price of Hershey's were to drop instead of it rotating in, it rotates out. Now what you're going to do is, uh, using your original indifference curve, right, the optimum on the original budget constraint, you're going to rotate the original budget constraint around the original indifference curve until it's parallel to the new budget constraint. Or what you could do is you could take the new budget constraint and shift it in parallel until it's tangent to the original indifference curve. We'll do the same thing. Whether you move it around the salad bowl until it's parallel to the new one, or you take the new one and you shift it until it's tangent to the salad bowl, it does the same thing. Salad bowl is my fancy word for the indifference curve. So that move, right, that new tangency, that move from the original optimal bundle to that new bundle, that's your substitution effect. Then what you're going to do is you're going to find, and by find, we're going to see what that means, the indifference curve tangent to the new budget constraint. So that move from B, the post-substitution effect bundle, to the final consumption bundle on the new budget constraint is the income effect. It's really easy. It's always the same three steps. And once you've internalized this a bit, you're going to be masters of drawing this. Trust me. It's not that hard. Look much harder than it is. OK. So let's do this, all right? Let's mess around with this. Earlier, I showed you what this looks like for a price increase. But just to show you that memorizing what these pictures look like is a waste of time, it's much better to memorize the steps of how to get there and applying these steps. Much more flexible approach to life in general. Let's imagine a price drop for Hershey's. And let's draw that for an inferior good. Ready. Set, go. Uh, OK. So what I've got in mind here is we're going to start Hershey's here. No. I'm so excited about income and substitution effects, I can't even get my Reese's and Hershey's axes straight. So Reese's on the y-axis, Hershey's on the x-axis. We're going to start with a relatively steep budget constraint. Starts at 10, goes to 5. So you could think of this as a setting where you have $10, Reese's are $1, and Hershey's are $2. And we're going to let the price of Hershey's drop by 50%. All right? Here we go. So this here is the old budget constraint. And this one here is the new one. If you needed to write out numbers, let y be 10, price of Hershey's be 1, price of Reese's be 1. Ah, oh, sorry, it starts out with 2. Oh, starts out with 2 because we start with 10.5, and then price of Hershey's drops to a dollar. OK, so we go from being able to afford 5 Hershey's to being able to afford 10 of them. So let me draw a scenario that's consistent with Hershey's actually being an inferior good. So the way to do this is to start relatively far up here, draw an indifference curve that comes in pretty steep, this tangent here, and then comes down nice and flat like this. OK, so this is I1. This is the original indifference curve. The steeper budget constraint is the old budget constraint with the higher price of Hershey's. And now what we're going to do is we're going to drop the price of Hershey's. Your budget constraint rotates out. And I want to figure out what the income substitution effect is. Right? So to get to the substitution effect, and to get my shoelace out again, I could do two things. I could do what we did earlier, take the budget constraint, the, the new one, shift it in parallel until we get to the point of tangency. It's going to be somewhere here. Right? Or I could just take the old budget constraint and rotate it around until it looks parallel to the new budget constraint. Would get you the same point. So either way works. Shift in the new one parallel, or take the old one and rotate it until it looks parallel. Gets you the same point of tangency. So if we do that, that fake budget constraint that only economists ever observe has a point of tangency, say, somewhere here. So I think we agree that this is a good point of tangency right here. So this is point B. The original tangency is our point A here. So our substitution effect is one where we go from A, which is roughly two Hershey's, to 3.3 Hershey's or whatever it is. Right. So this is going to be my substitution effect. So does this gel with our intuition? The answer is Hershey's became relatively cheaper. There was a price drop of Hershey's. So I substituted away from Reese's towards more Hershey's. Substitution effect goes in the right direction. You always move away from the relatively more expensive towards the relatively less expensive good. So A to B is the substitution effect. It will always go in the same direction. If prices drop, it'll point to the right. If prices increase, it'll point to the left, always. Now here comes the income effect. Right? I am now on this original indifference curve here. Uh, but my true new budget constraint is this one. Can I be on a higher indifference curve than I1? Yes, right? This guy asks questions, really annoying. Uh, so the point here is, yes, you can be on a higher indifference curve. So what you want to do is you're going to figure out the indifference curve that's tangent to your new budget constraint. Right? Take the imaginary one, shift it out here. So we want to figure out the optimal consumption bundle on this new budget constraint. But we also, as it says up here, want to make sure that Hershey's are inferior. So if price drops, this means your real income goes up. If income goes up and Hershey's are inferior, that means the quantity of Hershey's from B to wherever we land for point C should be lower. Right? So the point of tangency has got to be to the left here. Right? To the left here, H is inferior. To the right here, h is normal. How do you see that? Well, you start at b, you shift out your budget constraint parallel, and your consumption of Hershey's increases. Income goes up, Hershey's consumption goes up, Hershey's are normal. If you shift out your budget constraint parallel, and your consumption of Hershey's goes down, Hershey's are inferior. Right? So if we want to draw a tangency or an indifference curve for an individual who for uh, for an individual that